I will now hand over to Professor Fukuyama. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Your Grace. That was an excessively generous introduction, and I really appreciate it. I uh, appreciate being invited here to UCT, uh, to this hall. Uh, this is actually my second uh, visit to Cape Town in South Africa. I was here actually almost exactly 20 years ago, in 1991, after the announcement of the opening, but before the new South Africa had actually appeared. And it's been really quite a remarkable uh, I'm, I've only been here, this is my, I guess, um, uh, third day now, but it's really been remarkable to see uh, the amazing changes uh, that have occurred uh, in this country. And so it's uh, something that I am uh, very grateful to be a witness of and, and um, appreciate very much. I also very much appreciate the opportunity given by this new Graduate School of Development Policy and Practice. Uh, we've had this uh, wonderful mini course these past three days. The, these remarkable students who are not students, but they're actually uh, rising stars in their respective uh, bureaucracies or companies. Uh, we've had this uh, uh, amazing set of sessions. And so uh, this has altogether been a, an extremely positive uh, uh, visit for me. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, this new book. Uh, the title, the full title, is The Origins of Political Order from Pre-Human Times to the French Revolution. And that means that there's another volume in theory on its way that will get us from the French Revolution uh, up to the present. Uh, however, I do think that the early history of institutions actually can tell us uh, a fair amount about where we are in the present, and I'll explain that as we go along. The reason that um, I got into this particular grandiose subject is actually related uh, to the, you know, the issues that the Archbishop was mentioning. Uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins, where I had taught uh, prior to going to Stanford, I was the director of the International Development Program, looking at and training students and thinking about problems of uh, global poverty and how to fix it. And I think one of the most important conclusions uh, looking at Africa or especially looking at this whole universe of weak and failed states, you know, places like Afghanistan, Somalia, uh, Haiti, uh, and so forth, that in fact the economic um, disparities in the world are really due not to resource disparities, because we know of plenty of resource-rich countries that uh, are still a mess. Uh, they're really due to politics. They're due to the absence of basic uh, institutions. Uh, and I have spent a fair amount of time you know, thinking about very concrete uh, countries. I've spent a fair amount of time in Melanesia, for example, on behalf of the World Bank, places like Papua New Guinea or Timor-Leste or the Solomon Islands, all of which see, saw a collapse of their governments uh, and um, the ensuing chaos uh, and economic um, uh, disaster that followed on that. And then the question, so, and, and the international community has been heavily involved in trying to do state building because there's a recognition that you can't have development, uh, you can't have social justice unless you have a state that can actually deliver basic public goods. But the problem is uh, this problem that I identified as the one of getting to Denmark, where Denmark is this mythical place, it's not perhaps a real country, it's a mythical place that is democratic, low corruption, prosperous, uh, does well on virtually every measure uh, of human happiness. And in fact, these happiness surveys that are done, the Danes uh, all claim that they're the happiest people in the world. And I think that one of the problems in the international donor community when they deal with poor countries uh, and they think about what do we want these countries to look like, they think of Denmark. Uh, they think, you know, we want Afghanistan or Somalia or Haiti uh, to look like Denmark. Uh, and um, it's a tremendously uh, ambitious program, and it's one that always disappoints us. And it occurred to me at a certain point that part of the problem that we're having is that we ourselves do not understand how Denmark got to be Denmark. Uh, I actually have some direct experience with this because I've had a visiting professorship 
at Aarhus University in Denmark for the last few years. I've actually been going to Denmark and talking to a lot of Danes, and I can tell you that the Danes themselves don't know how they got to be uh, where they are. Uh, and I think that the reason for that is that the route to modern institutions uh, was actually long, violent, uh, unpleasant, uh, and uh, extremely painful. And in a certain sense, uh, those of us that are fortunate to live in developed countries with strong institutions have, in a certain sense, completely suppressed the memory uh, of the, you know, the sequence and the, and, the, and the building of these institutions. We can take them for granted. In my uh, country, the United States, in fact, we make a political hobby uh, of disparaging the state uh, or the government and uh, saying that it's always getting in the way of the private sector of private initiative. Uh, and so forth, and don't appreciate the fact that if you really want to go to a place that doesn't have a state that doesn't get in your way, you should move to Somalia. Um, <laughs> and so I do think that it is, it is particularly important that we think about uh, the origin of institutions, and that's really what this book uh, is all about. And so I go all the way back, not just to early human history, but actually to primate uh, behavior, because I do think that that explains uh, a lot about uh, the nature of political development. The other thing I wanted to do in this was not to give this typical Eurocentric account uh, of hu human history, which would be would have been taught in a English, you know, to an English schoolboy uh, in the 19th century, where things begin with Greek democracy and then the Magna Carta and the Glorious Revolution and so on to the present. Uh, because I think that in fact, if you look at global history. Uh, certain important institutions actually arose in other parts of the world before they did in Europe. And in particular, the uh, history of England that Karl Marx and other modernization theorists took as paradigmatic is not a good guide for how any other country is going to modernize because England is a very peculiar place. I mean, its <laughs> pattern of, its pattern of um, uh, development uh, is one that we should not expect any other country really to uh, ever uh, replicate. And so having a perspective that's broader than the usual rise of the West uh, one was uh, quite important. Uh, so let me first, since I'm an academic, I have to do this, I have to give you some definitions. Uh, I'm going to talk about political development and, and, and the development of institutions. There are three sets of institutions that I uh, focus on that I think are the building blocks of a modern state, of, of a modern um, polity. The first one of these is the state itself. Max Weber, the great German sociologist, defined the state as a legitimate monopoly of violence over a defined territory. I think that's a good definition. That is what makes a state a state. A state is all about power. It is about the ability to concentrate power, uh, to use it to enforce the rules of the state, uh, in a way that is accepted as legitimate by the citizens that live there. And so the state is really, uh, 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 you know, in a way, violence and, and coercion are always lurking behind it. A modern state, again, using Weber's definition, uh, is one that is not, um, th that, is, that is impersonal, in which the state does not treat you differently because you're the cousin or the nephew of the ruler, uh, or your, your friends, or there's some personal relationship. A modern state treats its uh, citizens on a universal basis uh, based on uh, relatively uh, transparent rules. And so the modern state uh, is, you know, you, you've had states for thousands of years, but the modern state is a very different and, and much more difficult thing uh, to create. The second uh, important set of institutions is the rule of law. Uh, I think that there are probably as many definitions of the rule of law as there are uh, law professors. Uh, and, you know, some of them are straightforward. It may be just, you know, things like human rights or uh, uh, just law and order. However, I think in political terms, the most uh, important definition and the one that I use is as follows. The rule of law is a set of rules of justice reflecting the moral views of a particular uh, society, but it is not the rule of law unless it is binding on the most powerful members of that society, meaning in most cases the king, monarch, the president, the prime minister. So in other words, 
if the head of the executive of a country uh, is able to make up rules as he or she goes along, that is not the rule of law. The rule of law has to be binding on the most powerful elites uh, in the society. All right? So the state concentrates power, but the rule of law, by my definition, uh, uh, restricts it. The final category is accountability. Uh, I use accountability rather than democracy for a couple of reasons. Accountability simply means the government has to reflect some kind of common good, reflecting the interests of the citizens of the society and not the ruler's self-interest. You find this definition, I think, in uh, Aristotle's uh, politics. Uh, accountability today we understand as multi-party democracy with free and fair elections. Uh, but I think the term accountability is a little bit broader and more useful uh, because for, for a couple of reasons. One is the earliest forms of accountability, uh, parliament after the glorious revolution in England, uh, only represented about 10% of the English population. So it wasn't modern democracy uh, in any respect, and yet it established a principle of accountability that the king had to go to parliament uh, for taxation and for other uh, important reasons. Second has to do really in a way with China because we in the West associate accountability with certain formal procedures like uh, elections, but there is also moral accountability. Uh, that is to say rulers can be trained or educated to be more or less uh, oriented towards a common uh, interest. And one of the characteristics of Chinese Confucianism, and in fact, in, in a certain way, the essence of that ethical doctrine was a doctrine of rule that said that the primary duty of a ruler uh, is to this, you know, the broader society and, and not simply uh, to himself. And I think that this is actually quite important in the modern world, because if you think, where have all the successful authoritarian modernizing societies been, they all cluster in East Asia. South Korea, Japan, before it became a democracy, Taiwan, the People's Republic of China, Singapore, these are all within a Chinese uh, cultural space and they're all characterized in an authoritarian period by authoritarians that were developmentally uh, oriented that had a sense of public uh, good that transcended you know, their, their uh, immediate uh, self-interest. And so I believe that that is also uh, one form of accountability. All right, so you have the state which concentrates power, you have the rule of law that limits it, and you have accountability which further limits uh, the ability of states to do what they want. And if you think about what a modern liberal democracy is, it ought to be all three of those in a balance. And the fact that we can actually produce states like this is something of a minor miracle because modern states are unbelievably powerful. You know, President Obama could order a nuclear strike on any country in uh, the world, but he doesn't do it because uh, it is a rule-governed society that has all of these checks and balances that uh, constrain the potential uh, great power of the state. And so the real question in terms of political development is how did we get uh, to a system that has all three of these in balance? The other important point is that these three components of political order can be had in any combination, and the fact that you've got one does not uh, presuppose that you're going to have the other ones. And so we can think of a lot of cases. Singapore has no accountability, but it's got uh, the rule of law, and it's certainly got a, a, a strong uh, state. Um, uh, Russia has accountability in the sense that they've got uh, elections, but they've got a very weak rule of law, and again, they've got a strong state. I think many developing countries have a problem uh, in that they may be democratic and they may have some form of rule of law, but the state is extremely weak and, and therefore unable to uh, enforce laws. And so every one of these three components is something that needs to be um, uh, there in order, I think, to have a successful modern society. Now, I'm going to explain to you why I begin with primates, because I believe that the building blocks of human sociability uh, are biological. Uh, that, uh, in fact, you have uh, observable, you know, uh, things, something that looks like observable human politics even among uh, groups of chimpanzees when they're observed in the wild. Alliances, hierarchies, 
uh, competition, political competition, uh, and the like. There are two basic biological principles that I think are critical in human social organization. Humans are social animals by nature. Biologists define or, or, or understand you know, basically two important principles. One is kin selection or uh, what's sometimes called inclusive fitness. This simply means that across any sexually reproducing species, uh, individuals will be altruistic in proportion to the number of genes that they share with uh, another um, you know, individual. Uh, this is basically a principle of nepotism, that we favor uh, genetic relatives. And it's not just we humans, uh, uh, virtually any other sexually reproducing animal uh, will do this. Second principle is what's called the principle of reciprocal altruism, uh, an exchange of favors on a face-to-face -face, uh, personal basis. And of course, human beings do this, but so do you know, a lot of species. In fact, different species engage in reciprocal altruism uh, towards one another. So in other words, you've got these two very simple, obvious principles. One, uh, a nepotistic principle of favoring family and a reciprocity principle that evolves uh, very readily among many different types of animals that is basically a principle of favoring friends. And so we have a natural mode of sociability uh, that makes us tend to favor friends and family. Uh, and this is what I would label patrimonialism. Uh, you, it is the default form of human sociability. All human societies will engage in these kinds of behaviors. Uh, and in a certain sense, the rise of a modern political order, which, as I said, was impersonal, uh, is a fight. It's a constant fight against these biological principles. You cannot have a modern state that is built on the, on the principle of favoring uh, just your friends and family. All right? And so the question when you're talking about political development is how did we get beyond this patrimonial principle? Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that because this is a default form of human sociability, it is the one we always go back to in the absence of institutions that make us uh, uh, behave differently. And so when order breaks down, we don't go into a Hobbesian state of the war of all against all. We go back to favoring friends and family. Whoops. Uh, so, um, so let's begin. I'm going to give you a couple of historical examples uh, from each of the three baskets, the state, the rule of law, and accountability, just to show uh, where these things came from. So the state uh, in my book really uh, is a story about China, about ancient China. Uh, the question is, uh, where did the Chinese state originally come from? Uh, there's, of course, a social scientist, well-known social scientist, uh, Charles Tilley that famously argued that uh, war made the state and the state makes war. And unfortunately, uh, I think this is absolutely true. He was talking about early modern Europe. But if you look at the history of ancient China and you ask why did they develop a powerful modern state very early on in their history, it is warfare. Uh, at the beginning of the Zhou dynasty, um, uh, the Western Zhou, about uh, the seventh century BC, China is split into perhaps 1,200 different polities. These are basically tribal units, uh, in effect. Uh, over the next 500 years, the Chinese fight this unbelievable series of wars uh, among themselves, in which that number of units falls from uh, 1,200 to a couple hundred. And then at the beginning of the, at the end of the, the spring and autumn period, the beginning of the Warring States period, it's now gone down to seven. And then in the year 221 BC, one of those states, the state of Qin, the western state of Qin, vanquishes all of the other rivals and emerges as a single centralized great power uh, in China. And I think Tilly's thesis works perfectly well in the Chinese context as well. This prolonged period of military competition forces a modern state on all of the surviving uh, polities in, in this uh, existential competition for survival. So, for example, wars used to be fought in ancient China by aristocrats on, on riding chariots, but it turns out that infantry armies were actually much more uh, efficient as soldiers, but to do that you had to conscript peasants. In order to conscript peasants, you had to pay them. Uh, you had to have savings.